Good evening, everybody. I just got the high sign from the back of the room saying, get going. So <laughs> uh, hopefully we'll uh, wrap up here before any inclement weather really rolls in. As I, as I drove up, there was on the, on the radio a tornado watch is in progress. So uh, hopefully, hopefully we won't be interrupted by anything like that. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, coming out this evening, and uh, thank you to Oak Knoll for inviting me. Um, I want to take a moment and thank uh, some of my colleagues who contributed to this research. I'm sort of here as the reporter, but these were actually some of the doers of the work. So Angela Collins, Cindy Peterson, Melody Pope, and Bill Whitaker all work for me at the Office of the State Archaeologist. I am the State Archaeologist for Iowa. We're based at the university. Um, we have been since 1959. We're a relatively well-kept secret. Um, I always run into people who have no idea that there is a state archaeologist, let alone that, in this case, he is based at the university. But um, we have a thriving program. We have 22 full-time employees. We serve as the state archaeological repository. So we have um, artifacts from an estimated 11,000 archaeological sites from Iowa. Uh, approximately four million artifacts. What's a shame is that we have hardly anywhere to display them. So most of them are carefully stored in bags and boxes for uh, 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 long-term preservation, and it is possible to pull things out and use them for comparative research or to put them into exhibits, but most of the things we have don't see the light of day all that frequently, which I think is too bad. But um, uh, if you ever go on campus, though, and go to a McBride Hall, the displays that are there in what's called um, Iowa Hall, uh, which has the culture history timeline for Iowa, those artifacts are from the State Archaeological Repository. That is my office. So we, we're on, we work with a cooperative basis with the museum to, to display what we, what we can there. Okay, so in any case, um, the talk tonight that I want to share with you is uh, focused on some work that was done several years ago but uh, I think it's still very interesting and pertinent. I hope, hope you do as well. And as you can see, it's, it has to do with flood recovery. So I'll show you some reminders of what it was like um, uh, 13 years ago uh, this summer. And uh, that will set the stage in part for what I'm going to talk about in, in more detail. But we have two locations, uh, what is now the Voxman School of Music at the corner of uh, Burlington and Clinton. Uh, and then uh, in Hubbard Park, opposite from the Iowa Memorial Union. Um, my office is about five blocks south of that Clinton Burlington Street address, so it was very exciting for us to get to work on a location that close to the office, because most of the time we're out and about the state someplace, and rarely do we get to work where we can literally walk to the job. So, so for that short period of time that we got to do that work, that was an exciting um, aspect of it for us. Uh, to give you a little context about uh, archaeology in the Iowa City area, my colleague Bill Whitaker put this map together for me. Uh, this has a count of a little over 200 total sites that are recorded in uh, approximately the Iowa City area there. And um, uh, the different time periods are color-coded over there. Uh, and you can see it's dominated by uh, uh, what's called unknown prehistoric, that is, sites of Native American ancestor connection, but we don't know even what time period it represents, whether it's 300 years old or 3,000 years old or older. Um, but we just know that material has been found there and uh, recorded. So those are all the little gray dots, so there's lots and lots of those. Um, uh, other major categories include a period called the Woodland Time Period, which uh, for archaeologists goes from about 800 BC to AD 1250, so it's almost 2,000 years long. Uh, this is a, an important time period in Iowa because it's when uh, the first agricultural efforts were uh, undertaken by Native Americans. Uh, they started to live in more sedentary village locations. They started practicing what was first horticulture and then became agriculture, full-blown corn-based agriculture eventually. Um, that's the period when burial mounds became very prevalent as well, uh, and the use of pottery as a technology for cooking and storing was super important. Uh, the other major period that there's um, uh, a good representation for in, in and around Iowa City is the historical period, which we define as starting at around 1830. 
And that's an approximate date, but that's about the earliest records we have of non-Native Americans getting to what became Johnson County in Iowa City. So the, some very early traders uh, came into this area. Uh, and in fact, there's a trading post south of town, which um, uh, a colleague of mine could give you a talk on that another time if, if you request it, um, uh, is one of the earliest sites for the whole Iowa City area. Um, Yeah, they don't match up super well, do they? The mounds, I think, the, what's, I, I would call sort of pinkish there, yeah. are these larger yeah. mound ones. Right, the historical. Uh, historical is brown, so it kind of fades into the background. Or, or I guess it must be these tannish colored ones, I, I guess. <laughs> As so. opposed to uh, archaic. Oh, no, that's right. That's the archaic, so. Oh, well. Oh, oh, oh that's interesting. Oh, I see. There's, a, there's an error here. <laughs> Good eyes there. See, the, down here the key says blue is historical. So, so that's supposed to be blue. That's an error there. So that's why there's all these blue dots. Those are the 43 historic ones. As you can see, there's a great concentration of, along the river. The rivers were the travel transportation corridors uh, pre-road system. Um, there are some archaeological sites associated like with this big interchange here and, and some of the other roadways because that's where archaeologists have been asked to look by the Department of Transportation for archaeological sites, so we have found them where we've been asked to look, and that would be the case along here as well. Um, so there's a combination of where people preferentially chose to put themselves on the landscape versus where we have had the opportunity to go and look on the landscape. So it's, a, it's a mishmash of those two things. But we're going to focus in on, um, on campus and, and, and really the heart of Heart of downtown, as you can see, there's not much recorded here. And in fact, uh, this map was put together prior to the completion of the project that we're going to talk about. So the sites that I'm going to talk about aren't even on this particular map. OK, so flood recovery. Uh, flood, the 2008 flood, of course, was a major impact on Iowa City and the campus. And because of that, the Federal Emergency Management Agency stepped in and provided money. And that money was directed towards recovery for specific impacts. It wasn't just, here's a pot of money, Iowa City and University of Iowa, do whatever you want. It had to be tied to a specific either building getting destroyed or some kind of, of um, uh, effort to replace something that was destroyed by the flooding. So the utility system was, was one of those things. And that ties into one of the, one of the things that we're talking about. Um, but tonight I want to talk about, so why the archaeology was conducted, uh, who were involved in that in terms of, of organizing the, the projects itself, uh, what's the process that was followed, because this is, a, this is a federalized compliance process. When FEMA gets involved, well really when, when any federal agency gets involved with historic preservation, there are, is a federal level law that directs the way that they do that. So I want to tell you a little bit about that process. Um, then we'll get into what's been found, again, Boxman and uh, Hubbard Park. And then what are the outcomes? Uh, what's happened since the project was finished? We'll wrap up with that. OK, so why was the archaeology conducted? Well, for those of you who were around uh, in Iowa City in 2008, you remember the river went way out of its bank. So this is up by the old Hancher. Uh, and you can see how extensive that damage was. And not only was Hancher, but the Boxman School was impacted, as well as the uh, theater that I'm not remembering the name of up there. Uh, so that was one major area. Uh, and then, of course, around the IMU, there was also a failed attempt to build a containment wall. And you can see the water penetrated well be, uh, beyond that as well. So these are just two of many locations that were affected. Uh, but these two happen to have some interesting archaeology associated with them. Uh, so again, it's part of federally funded flood recovery efforts that this archaeology happened. The um, sad part of the story is that if there had been no federal money, there would have been no archaeology. And that's because the state of Iowa and my employer, the University of Iowa, has, in their wisdom, decided that they don't do archaeology before major construction projects on campus. I have argued and until I'm blue in the face that that's not appropriate. But it persists, and um, so we're fighting against that. But in these two cases, because the federal money was there, if the university wanted the federal dollars, they had to follow the federal process. And that meant 
doing the archaeology. So for me, that was a win-win. I hope the university saw it that way too. So here are the, here are the partners in the project. Uh, the university obviously is a, was a critical. Uh, they were the applicant to FEMA asking for help. Uh, the city of Iowa City, of course, is the context within which the university is embedded and you can't really separate the two. So uh, there was also FEMA dollars going to city-related projects as well at the same time. The State Historic Preservation Office is based in Des Moines at the State Historical Society. And they actually have the legal responsibility for the state of Iowa to communicate with the feds on these kinds of projects, these federally funded undertakings as they're called. So uh, the, they represented the state. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, of course is the federal agency that's providing the funding. And then because of the way FEMA and the states work together, the state level version of FEMA, which we call the Iowa Homeland Security and Emergency Management Department, an unpronounceable acronym, um, was also involved. So they, they were another player at the state level that uh, was in all the discussions that were going on. So how does my office fit into it? The Office of the State Archaeologist is a first and foremost a research unit of the University of Iowa. So we have, uh, we're tied into the academic mission of the university, the research and the teaching and, and um, public outreach, uh, but we also wear another hat that was defined by the state code when the office was created that set up that we're the repository for the state, that we keep track of all known site locations, that we are in charge of ancient burial protection. Uh, Iowa, as a side note, topic for another, another evening, but Iowa was the first state in the country to have legislation protecting ancient human remains, something that we should all be proud of. Um, and um, we also have uh, a public archaeology uh, uh, wing as well to, to engage with the public. Uh, but most of what we do is research in support of this compliance process that I've been talking about. So most of the staff, uh, over half of the staff of those 22 are 100% funded by the contract money that comes from entities like FEMA or the Department of Transportation and others who need archaeological specialists to help them. Okay, so here's a little bit about the, the consultation process, the, the federal process that was created in 1966 and passed as the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, it's, this is boiled down, a very complicated set of rules I've boiled down into seven easy steps uh, to, to communicate tonight. First of all, you have to establish who the partners are, and we've already presaged who those are. You have to ideally, prior to construction, determine whether there's any archaeological sites involved. And I've asterisked that prior because in our case tonight, that was not what uh, the order of actions were. Uh, if there are significant sites, then you need to either avoid them or create a plan to mitigate the impacts to them. Okay? Uh, so the important distinction here is that not all sites that are discovered in step two are in fact significant. There's lots of locations where there's historic or prehistoric material preserved, but it's so jumbled up, uh, it's been so impacted, it's so decayed, that all you can really say is, that, yep, something happened here, but you can't really learn anything from it. That would be a non-significant site. A significant site, by definition, is one where there's something that can be learned, essentially, by researching it, documenting it, preserving it. So you sort out the non-significant ones from the significant ones. If they can't be avoided, then you have to do something about it. Uh, you then uh, seek public comment on the plan. This is supposed to be an open public process, so the plan details are shared. Uh, sometimes there are adjustments because of public comment. Uh, then the partners all have to agree. Ultimately, there has to be agreement among the partners that this is what's going to happen, this is what it's going to cost, this is who's going to do it, and what are the outcomes. Sometimes there's adjustments in that step. Six is implementing the plan. That's the fun part. That's when the archaeology actually happens is number six. And then sharing the results, which I'm still doing here uh, uh, years later, and uh, hopefully we'll do so into the future as well. So my asterisk of prior is conditioned as whenever possible. But um, because of the way the floods worked, because of the areas that were impacted, and because of the long, drawn-out process, 
that uh, is involved when you deal with FEMA in particular, um, there was a disjunct between when the archaeology could happen uh, versus when construction was happening. So uh, Hubbard, uh, yeah, Hubbard Park up here, uh, the, the Union area, um, that actually, that work happened in the dead of winter. Not an ideal time to do archaeology. Uh, but it was when the construction was going on, and again because of, of uh, uh, the way the project partners decided to do things, that was when it had to happen. And uh, we weren't able to get out there before construction, but during construction. Similarly, on the Voxman School of Music site, um, this work uh, was impossible to conduct uh, archaeologically because it was so deeply buried. In fact, there was no trace of it near the surface, so it was an unexpected finding during construction. So we'll talk more about that as we go on. Okay, so let's start with Voxman, and then we'll go on to Hubbard. So the Boxman School of Music location, again, for those who uh, remember the, the intersection there, uh, had these lovely uh, bank buildings um, uh, out on the corner. That's an aerial shot. Whoops, I'm sorry. That presaged things a little bit too fast. Which way am I going here? There we go. There we go. Sorry. Here's an aerial view of the parking lots and the two bank buildings that were on the corner. Uh, I think this is um, probably the Clinton Street side and Burlington's on this side. Anyways, because of those existing buildings, there was no way to do archaeological sampling. Uh, typically, if we're doing a project, say, for the DOT, it's probably new construction of a roadway somewhere where there's nothing but maybe farm fields, in which case it's relatively straightforward to go out and either look at the ground surface for artifactual material or bring in a coring device and, and dig some cores to, to look at the, uh, what's beneath. But when there's concrete all over the place and existing buildings, that's impossible. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, we weren't able to detect that there might be archeological uh, information there until construction removed the fill. So that of course is uh, our artist rendering of uh, the beautiful building that got built there, uh, which took up a much bigger footprint. And in order to do that construction, they had to open up uh, the better part of the corner of the block uh, at, at Clinton and Burlington. And they put in the shoring system because this is the ground surface around the edge here where that parking lot surface was. The construction footprint had to go way deep, much, much deeper even than this. But it's when we got to this level in here that the archaeological material started to show up and they had to halt construction in this part of the area. They continued around the exterior um, while we took care of the, uh, the archaeological material. Uh, it was a uh, monitor, actually, that was assigned to the construction team who saw some um, uh, brick and some charcoal pop up when one of the guys took a big scoop out and was like, wait a minute, we got to check this out, and did that. Uh, this is an 1868, a portion of an 1868 map that I'll show you a couple times here, but uh, this is a relatively accurate depiction of the buildings that were actually present at the time. And they're called bird's eye view because um, uh, they, they have this you know, perspective from relatively far away. But uh, as you can see at Clinton and Burlington Street, there was uh, a building right on that corner. So we had a little bit of historical information that something might be preserved there, but we didn't know anything about the fill sequence that uh, we were able to document once things were being constructed. So let's take a look at that. So it turns out that there was over eight feet of fill brought in sometime between probably 1860 to 1870 and currently, because uh, again, that parking lot is sitting up at this level here. So all this fill was brought in over the years to flatten out that intersection area to make it buildable for uh, later construction. Archaeologically, then, you go back through time from 2010, 2008 was 2013 when we dug, down to this level, you're going back uh, to 1870, let's say, to the top of that surface. And then the archaeological uh, material was all in this upper two feet of this original soil. So that was the landscape at that point in time in, in 1870. We had another uh, historic map that uh, we were able to look at. There's a, a company called Sanborn 
that went around the country making maps for fire insurance purposes. So the Sanborn fire insurance maps are a super useful tool for historic archaeology because they oftentimes had very accurate, you can see these even have some dimensions to them, they were drawn to scale um, uh, that showed lot lines and uh, building locations and once in a while some outdoor features but uh, oftentimes not. So again this gave us a clue that in this area that we were uh, excavating that there might be something there and then we were able to back plot the actual archaeological features which are these green things on those locations. So what, what are those things there? We, so we talk about a, a, uh, a building foundation of some sort, a privy, a stone wall feature, and number four is also another, another one. So that's what these things look like on the ground once they were exposed. Um, the, uh, the, arche the construction excavation is very coarse. They use a big bucket with a tooth and are taking out huge amounts of dirt. But once we were able to stop them and get out the, the, the finer scale tools, we were able to expose what turned out to be a well feature. And the artifacts that came out of the well date from as early as 1855 to as long uh, or as recently as 1925, so a relatively long lived well. It probably had um, additional courses added to it as Phil was brought in and, and kept in use for a period of time. This is the feature that uh, we labeled as a structure of some sort. And this dates artifactual wise from 1840s to 1860s. So that turned out to be one of the earlier uh, features that we, we discovered. Uh, we now think that it's probably the base of a small trade cabin that some, um, someone had come in there, set up a, a cabin, and used it as a trade center. And then this was a beautifully preserved uh, privy feature with mm -hmm. artifacts from the 1840s to 1860s and uh, another uh, very nice feature uh, dating a little bit longer, 1840s to 1870s. So as early as the 1840s, that stretch along the bluff above the Iowa River, that if you go down Burlington Street, you go from up high to down into the river valley, uh, that area there was a scene of a lot of uh, early activity uh, in what became then Iowa City. And here's some additional photographs of the, the work. So this is now a profile. So we were looking at the surface. Oh, I'm sorry, I keep hitting that button accidentally. There we go. The pointer is just above the advanced button. So, so we were looking at the surface, this portion of it. This is the cutaway view, the profile view of a beautifully preserved and very nicely excavated uh, feature and chock-a-block full of layers of interesting stuff. Um, uh, fortunately, old enough that the not so interesting stuff is not not an issue, which is very nice. Um, well, we'll get we'll get to that in a second. So, but good question. Uh, this is the uh, well feature, partially exposed. We couldn't go all the way to the bottom of this because it was structurally unsound, and it would have been very very expensive to put OSHA safe shoring all the way down. But we were able to sample deep enough into it that we felt like we had gotten some of the earliest material possible. We did some cores down through to, to pull up material without having to actually physically be down in it. Um, uh, and then this is the, once that um, cabin area was cleaned up, we had a very nice clean exterior foundation wall for that cabin and there was some interesting interior material there as well. Um, so, uh, in terms of uh, what we found, um, let's start with uh, the cabin. This is uh, a chunk of, of fused together, basically, artifactual materials and other sediments that came from what we think would have been under the cabin floor. Did it again, sir? Oh, I really jumped. Uh, you'll see where we're going. We'll, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get back to that. Okay. Uh, but what's really interesting uh, here and which helps establish that it was probably a trade cabin is this cluster of beads. These are little uh, round seed beads and then tubular beads as well. And these were very much the style that traders were uh, exchanging with Native Americans uh, on the quote unquote frontier, uh, which Iowa City would have been right on the edge of at that time. So, so uh, those, the presence of those helps confirm that that's a, that's a yeah, trading center. Uh, uh, from the one privy, we had uh, these goblets and bricks. So for some reason, someone had a big party 
and decided not to do their dishes and they dumped them in the privy or maybe they all got broken and they were like, well, what do we do with these? The privy's a hole in the ground, we'll throw it in there. Um, uh, also from that um, privy was a mass of seeds. Those are raspberry seeds. So somebody had a whole lot of raspberries and then left this for us to find later. Um, uh, this is um, an interesting device. Uh, we were able to do some historical research uh, and determine that it's probably one of these lady syringes, uh, which were advertised. Um, um, uh, let's see, I can't quite read what it says. Um, one piece of the best soft rubber, always ready for instant use. So, so from the Goodyear Rubber Company. So before they got into tires, I guess they were, they were making these things. My favorite piece, though, from the Boxman School of Music is this uh, music holder, Lear, um, which came from the well. And it couldn't have come at a more timely moment because uh, there was a great deal of stress being experienced by the university administration over the fact that these archaeological finds had showed up. Um, why? Because it impacts construction schedules. And that's big money, right? So there was a great fear that this was going to turn into something humongous and shut the whole project down for months and uh, uh, cause all kinds of pain and agony. Well, fortunately, um, literally the day when those discussions were starting to burble up on campus, uh, the team discovered this particular piece. The director of the School of Music found out about it. He got super excited. Obviously, this is just iconic for the new School of Music. And he saw it as a good omen. So his, his um, uh, uh, support and, and um, energy helped to downplay the, those on the university administration who were fearful, and everything worked out fine. Uh, in fact, we were only on site for 10 days. Um, construction did not stop at any time during that period. It only was halted in the area we were digging. They were still able to do other activities around us. So, so um, no harm, no foul in, in that case. Um, but uh, this was, as I recall, the top of the fold in the Iowa City Press Citizen that day. So it was a, a nice uh, bit of, of confirmation we were doing a good thing. How big was it? Oh, it's, uh, it's one of those smaller ones, about, about that big. Yeah. Um, Any theories about why it ended up there? No, I, you know, it's, a, it's in a well, and wells often became um, trash dumps like the privies do. So. Uh, uh, and, it, and it may date to, we don't have a firm date on it, but the, uh, there was a building built on that property um, after 1900 that was a boarding house. That's the one that's sh probably uh, shown in that bird's eye view. Um, and it may have been that there was a music student or somebody in there who, for whatever reason, just looked at it. But, uh, but interesting thing to, to have there. So I want to jump over to Hubbard Park now and show you some of what we did there. Uh, this is a view, I think, from 1895. We'll come back to it, but it's looking back up at the, the Pentecost and, and the, the old cat is right there. Um, but of interest for our purposes, this, this is what is now Hubbard Park and some of the buildings that were along, um, that's Madison Street there, I believe, um, with, the, with the backs onto what is now. Those, again, this gave us a clue of there might be something out there. So uh, looking back at the historic map here, we have uh, what's called Capitol Square. At the time this map was made, this was 1839, so this is pre-university. The State House was either built or planned, um, so that's old cap there. In it was Capitol Square, and then of course Courthouse Square is down here where the courthouse was built. And we were just looking at Burlington and Clinton, which uh, there's Clinton, which one of these is Burlington? these two uh, were where we were. Um, other things of interest on this uh, is that there was a little a little bridge going across here and there's it says proposed high oh boy <laughs> I goofed that up. Yeah. There it is. Proposed high bridge. So that's probably the Burlington Street Bridge location there or, or no that's Highway Avenue there. So that, that would be the Highway Avenue bridge. Um, Relatively open ground opposite uh, what's now uh, the IMU area. This is a road from Newton is the way it's labeled. So there wasn't much between Iowa City and Newton at that time. Um, but this low open ground um, 
uh, suggests that this is an area that the river might have been crossable before any of the bridges were built, that there was supposedly a ford somewhere in here. And that may be why people um, congregated in what's now Hubbard Park before getting across. Um, other interesting features, there's a big island up in the river up here that's no longer extant, and you can see that this whole area has been sort of reshaped through time. So these historic maps can be very, very informative. So uh, the reason that uh, we worked in Hubbard Park, again, uh, the, the flood impacted the utilities serving the IMU and some of the other buildings downriver, uh, upriver, excuse me, and uh, didn't actually, the floods didn't actually hit the park itself, but all the utility corridors that were buried deeply along the river here were all flooded out. Many of them couldn't be salvaged. Uh, and so new utility quarters had to, be, had to be designed and brought in. And one of those came from um, the east across Madison Street into Albert Park and then cut along and paralleled Madison, cut across this portion of the park before going into the IMU to service that. And so that's a new flood-proof utility um, corridor there. Uh, but because FEMA dollars were used, federal dollars were used, they had to do archaeological work. And in this case, it um, uh, was a little less well coordinated than it could have been, but still good things came out of it. So here's a clip out of that previous photo that I showed you, zoomed in a little bit, again, uh, 1895. So these are houses that are facing onto Madison Street. So we're looking at the backyards, basically in the park, what might have been there. So again, gave us some interesting clues. So here's the, uh, uh, the IMU parking lot. So the IMU is just to the north. This is where that uh, utility quarter came in, turned, and went around. So uh, for reasons I can't adequately explain, this particular trench was closely monitored uh, at the time that it was done, but nothing was found. And this portion of the trench got monitored, but nothing was found. But for some reason, um, and it might have been poor communication uh, between contractors and university and FEMA and all the other parties, this part we weren't alerted to until the trench had been cut. And at that time, there were things in the cut wall. And we got a call saying, hey, there, you might want to come look at this. And we're like, well, it would have been better if we'd been there when it was being opened up. But, you know, we take what we can get. So um, most of these turned out to be privies and uh, cisterns that didn't have much of anything in them. So mostly just clean fill, not really archeologically very interesting. So, so not, not too uh, important. But this area right in here uh, turned out to have some interesting uh, deposits. And one of those is a 1842 to 1860 house foundation that you can see exposed here uh, that we were able to document. Uh, oh, I forgot to point out uh, two of the early finds that were made. An 1848 coin and a um, ancestral Native American uh, stone spear point. This is one that conforms to what archaeologists call the late, wood, or late archaic period, excuse me, probably 3,000 to 5,000 years old. So we got very excited that maybe there was something substantial here. Again, the university wasn't too excited about it, but, uh, but, uh, but we were. Uh, but as it turned out, that was one of relatively few Native American artifacts. Most of what was found was from the 1840s to 1860 time period of early Iowa City. Um, here are some of the uh, shots from that time period. So this was February of 2014, and that was a very, very cold February. The temp outside temps were near zero, but uh, the funding that FEMA provided allowed for tents to be built, and that's a big generator blowing hot air inside. So as you can see, um, once that had been running for a few hours, it was relatively comfortable to be inside this thing. The problem was it was super cramped. Uh, there was very little room to maneuver. Um, and uh, one of the things that we always do when we excavate is that we also screen the sediments that we pull up because those little tiny artifacts are often hard to see while you're actually digging. But if you put it through quarter inch mesh screen, you can obviously recover a lot more. But there was hardly any room to set that kind of thing up. Uh, so it was very constrained, very cramped, but we were getting some interesting findings. Um, things that looked like they would be significant from a research standpoint. 
So uh, here are some of the, the artifacts. Um, lots of different kinds of ceramics uh, from the time period. Uh, bowls and stems from pipes. Another little tiny uh, Native American point, that's a true arrowhead there. Very, very tiny, you can see the person's finger. Uh, a portion of what uh, appears to have been a whale oil lamp. Lots and lots of buttons, different sizes and materials, bone, wood, metal, um, uh, and then more coins. So uh, uh, quite a few interesting kinds of uh, period uh, coins were found. What's the whale oil lamp made of? Uh, that's glass. Uh, blown, blown glass or something. Kind of so it has interesting, yeah, little, decorative. Uh, mm -hmm, yeah, additions oh, onto it. Yeah. And that's just a small portion of what would have been a larger thing, but uh, we were able to find that in a historical catalog and it looked like a pretty good match. Um, so, uh, in this situation, I decided to put my foot down, as tiny as it is from a political standpoint, uh, as state archaeologist. And I put together an argument that uh, and went to FEMA as the federal agency. The, the State Historic Preservation Office was on my side as well. Uh, but we had to convince FEMA. They're the funding agency, they're the federal agency. Uh, and we said that despite all the effort that was being done, tents and heaters and, and all this, it really wasn't adequate to the task. That there was information here that was going to be lost, that uh, we really should delay additional investigation until the weather improved, basically. And um, to my happy surprise, they agreed. And uh, this is unusual because the typical response of federal agencies is that you have to mitigate what's being impacted. And what we were proposing here is to take money and not spend it in that little impact corridor, but elsewhere in Hubbard Park. And so we flipped it from a, they tell us where to dig to the archeologists saying where they want to dig. And they approved it. So it was like, wow, that's, that's fantastic. So because of that, um, we were able to do more archival research. We had more time. So this is that bird's eye view again. And uh, this is the uh, Hubbard Park area of Iowa City in 1868. Um, we were able, so this is zooming in. So again, there were, there were clearly uh, structures along um, the, the street on this side, uh, Iowa Avenue, I guess it is and uh, some along Madison. So that was interesting. Uh, so these are some historic photographs that we were then able to match up. Uh, this is uh, over here in the, in the southwest corner here. And what we were able to determine with some historical research that in particular this stretch right along here was an early black neighborhood in Iowa City. So that had some interesting uh, implications to it. And then over around the corner or at the corner uh, there was a uh, little grocery store, I don't know if you can read groceries right there, and then some other buildings up along this edge. So there seemed to be good potential for other archaeology in Hubbard Park that could be explored. And we were able to work with uh, Art Bettis, who's now retired, but at the time was still in Earth and Environmental Sciences, and he had access to a soil pouring rig that he was able to come out, do the cores, interpret the sediment structure, and help us determine where preservation may or may not have been appropriate to, to find things. And this is my colleague, Bill Whitaker, uh, struggling to get soil samples pulled by hand, because these are little tiny um, two and a half or three inch diameter cores that tell you a little bit about the soil, but it's unlikely that you actually capture artifacts in that. And Bill's trying to do a larger eight inch diameter core uh, to sample through here. Um, but there were some things that were in the way, so he had to work on it. But ultimately, we were able to uh, do additional archaeology in what we call the south block down here, the southeast block, and then we returned up next to the February Trench and expanded out and explored this whole area in here, which uh, um, uh, proved to be very interesting. So this is the southwest corner. Um, unfortunately, the preservation down here was not as good as we were hoping for. There were several interesting features, but a lot of the area has seen a tremendous amount of redeposition, which this, the lighting's not good, but you can see all this swirling of lighter colors and darker color sediments. That's very characteristic of when um, the sediment materials get mixed. And, and so context here was not particularly good. So we documented a few things there and then moved over to the southeast corner. 
and in the southeast corner we actually hit some intact uh, cultural features uh, including this area here you can see is chocolate full of material that would line up right about here right to the uh, north of where that grocery store was um, a stir came out of, of that area there and then again lots of interesting kinds of artifactual material again loads of buttons lots of different ceramics with different patterns many of which can be dated relatively at least to decades if not better um, some more over here and then a, a, a handful of printers typeface so uh, we think there might have been an early newspaper or some kind of activity in, in that area there so that was kind of fun um, other southeast corner materials um, uh, we hit a portion of, uh, I think, what was interpreted as a root cellar and actually got this uh, complete, oops, complete pot out of there it is in situ and uh, was able to be put back together. And then a whole series of 16-gauge uh, shotgun shell caps came out of that feature as well, even to the point where you can't read the text, but there's three different types that were identifiable in there. Um, some doll parts, uh, a decorative wristband, uh, bone ornament uh, as well. And then we went up to the northeast corner to expand again around where the, uh, the February trench was. And in that unit there, we knew we were in the backyard of this house that we saw the edge of the foundation is. So this is, this is from that February trench. We just caught the edge of that house foundation. So we knew that we were in the backyard of the house. And so we wanted to open that area up, uh, going from east to west. And um, if your eyes are sharp, you can see that um, there's a pipe sticking out of the wall trench over here. So the, so the February trench is on the other side of this, uh, of this fencing here. Um, and now we're opening uh, to the west of that. And if we zoom into that area there, you can get a better sense of how complicated the deposits are here. Uh, so this stretch here is documented in this drawing. And this is one of the things that archaeologists spend a lot of time doing in their field work. They're not just collecting artifacts, they're collecting context. We're very, very interested in the association between things, the layering, um, but what is um, precisely uh, positioned uh, one to another, either up and down or back and forth. And so this very complicated diagram uh, records what we were destroying as we were digging it. So archaeology is a destructive science. Um, we have to kill our patient essentially to learn anything about it. So by digging this area out, ah, we have a terrible time with the clicker. There we go. Um, we, we learn things, but if we don't document it, then it's not worth anything. So I'm going to zoom into that little box here now. So just to give you a better a better view of just how interesting this is. So, so all these different zones are definable based on the sediments and the content within the sediments. So the cultural material that's in the geological context, essentially. And um, this lower zone is 1840s to 1860s. Then it goes early 1860s, late 1860s, 1860s to 1920s, post 20s. Uh, and then another layer of post-20 on top of that. This is that pipe that was sticking out of the wall. I can't quite see it there. Uh, there was an intrusive pit that's estimated to be from the 60s to 70s, uh, 1860s, 1870s. Mm -hmm. It cuts down in, into that. So again, this is the, the detail that the archaeologists are trying to record even as they're recovering the artifacts. Um, so a cistern was found, a root cellar, uh, another nice privy, all good uh, Good preservation context, lots of, lots of interesting material from all of those. What do you do with the stuff after you dig it up? Well, it has to go back to the laboratory and be processed. When it comes out of the, uh, the field, it's um, all jumbled together. Everything that was found, uh, you have lots of different kinds of stuff here. You have metal and bone and glass and, and pottery and, and such. Um, that all has to be sorted out. So the material, the first step is that the, the specialists in the laboratory, after the material is washed, is they start separating it out. They take the bone out from the metal. They get the pottery shirts separated. They look for the ones that have maker's marks or distinctive decorations that might tell us how old they are. Um, same with the glass. Um, and each of those categories of material then go to a specialist for the detailed kinds of analysis. And ultimately, it's documented in the and prepared for 
storage in the, um, in the repository. So here are some of the, uh, the Hubbard Park findings then from uh, those features that I just showed you. We saw earlier the two projectile points that were found. There was also a very interesting piece of carved shell which we suspect is Native American, but we don't know absolutely for sure. But it seems more similar to Native American artistry than, than what was being done by Europeans in the 1840s to 1860s. Perforated, shaped, probably was a pendant of some sort or another. There was um, uh, prehistoric era pottery, uh, low fire pottery. These decorations match the kind of pottery that was being used in the woodland time period. So there's a, probably uh, an early component associated with the late archaic, so three to 5,000 years old, and then a later component, which is probably the arrow point in the pottery uh, from um, the woodland time period, so 800 BC to 1250 AD. Um, this material is called flaking debris. This is the, the little pieces of rock that get knocked off of um, a tool when it's being made. So in order to create this, you have to take a whole series of small flakes off of this piece, and that's what that uh, remaining material is over there. So that was the, the early material. And then uh, we also found some material by doing a technique called flotation. You can get a little sense of the flotation device. Uh, this is a big tank which has water jets built into the bottom of it that when you turn it on, bubble water up in through a box which has a screen at the bottom, very fine mesh, window mesh size screen. And it separates all the sediment out. So uh, from privies in particular, where we're expecting small scale seeds uh, or bones or other kinds of remains, this is an excellent way to recover it efficiently because you can just bring in a big bag of soil from your feature, put it into this machine, process it. There is considerable microscope work time looking at things, but as you can see, we found lots and lots of blackberry seeds and then, interestingly, uh, uh, a giant intestinal roundworm egg uh, was also spotted and identified in there as well. So the folks who were using that privy had some, uh, so some issues. Uh, <laughs> um, we were able to look at animal bones for information about what people were eating. We found that uh, the, in this one uh, um, privy, a lot of chicken bone. Uh, and that led us to an interesting document that I just wanted to throw in that uh, talked about an early issue in Iowa City that uh, I, we got under control, I guess. Um, but this is from 1855 where this uh, general notice went out that it's, it's time to round up the hogs. They can't just run wild anymore. Um, so uh, it says, uh, all who disregard the ordinance by allowing their hogs to run at large hereafter, they may expect to pay the full penalty of the law, whatever that was at the time. Apparently, though, chickens were okay at that time, and we'll come back full circle to where you can have, you can have a couple chickens again. Right? Some other uh, findings then uh, on, the, on the pottery side. This is four views of actually the same vessel. It's just being rotated. Oh, darn it. There we go. And uh, maker's mark that, that makes it really easy to get an age on things. Uh, this is blue shell edge, very typical for the 1840s to 1860s, a floral pattern. Um, this is a blue transfer print, and that's me jumping ahead. Well, that's okay, that's where I want to be anyways. Uh, bottle glass, also uh, interesting. Uh, lots of different kinds of vessels represented. Um, and some of these things have socioeconomic indicators that are associated with them. Uh, that, um, uh, again, the specialist analyst can look at the record and, and try to paint a picture of what was the socioeconomic status of the occupants of, of that place. Well, um, um, like bottle, bottles yeah. that we use for some particular purpose. Right, yeah, those that would have been, or, or, the, or, the, or the quality of the china or, or other okay. kind of patterns, those kind of things. Some of those have been connected uh, to economic indicators. Uh, I can't tell you which ones are which, but I'll hand them. <laughs> um, but I know the people who can. Uh, other more functional kinds of things, uh, a spoke shave, which would have been a woodworking tool, uh, some horse related horseshoe and a, probably a harness piece. There's a crochet hook and a lace bobbin. Um, shoe buckle, this, this is interesting, a gun flint. So uh, somebody still had a, a, a flint lock uh, rifle of some time. Uh, some silverware up in the right hand corner and then lots and lots of pipes, pipe stems and pipe bowls and, and, 
and such as well. And then this uh, is the top of a cane, so this is rotted off at the bottom here, but that's the remaining silver portion of what would have been a pretty fancy project that, uh, that somebody lost. So what are the archaeological implications that we can draw from all this work that was done? Well, in addition to um, the preservation of the information itself, it all informs on our understanding of the setting. Um, so in terms of future research in the Iowa City area, these two projects told us a lot about soil formation processes and the archaeological preservation potential of different parts of town. So we had uh, the Hubbard Parks obviously down low on the River Valley landscape. Um, the uh, Boxman School of Music is up, up higher on the bluff. Uh, so now we know more about both those places than we ever did before. So they, they contribute to our general understanding of context. Uh, they also gave us very nice comparative artifact samples for what's called the early statehood era in Iowa history. Uh, so this 1840s to 1860 time period. We have both faunal and floral material from these digs. Uh, as I talked about, we have some economic status data based on some of the ceramics that were present. Um, we learned a little bit about parasite issues, and we learned something about the layout of uh, residential yards at that time that will help us again in future kinds of projects when we, when we do this research. And uh, particularly because of the work at, at uh, Hubbard Park, it allowed us uh, a window onto lower and middle income residents and help bring them into the story as well, because as you probably are aware, history tends to be written by and about the successful, not necessarily all people. So, uh, so archeology span is a window into some of these folks' lifestyles. And we were able to broaden community awareness and participation in archeology span and history, which is one of the goals of my office uh, and, and one of our mandates in terms of our position here at the university. So, uh, I didn't show photos, but particularly the extra work that we did at Hubbard Park, because it wasn't done in the context of active construction, we were actually able to bring in some school groups, and we had some fourth graders through sixth graders help us excavate, record information. Um, Art Bettis was able to bring in a couple of his grad students to help him with his research on the, uh, with the coring, and they also used some other um, uh, soil recording techniques once we had excavation units open. So uh, very broadly it, it contributed to the education mission of, of uh, the university. Some of the outcomes that we achieved include then, as I said, integration of the public. Uh, they did a great, actually I, I should point out that we had some volunteers in the lab that did a tremendous amount of work, um, way above and beyond anything that uh, we were able to afford from the, from the FEMA dollars those folks helped with, so that was really important. Conservation and curation of recovered artifacts, those materials are in the repository, and I just actually today confirmed that um, a history class that's being taught this fall is going to come down and visit. They want to see the Hubbard Park collection. The professor wants them to do some further research on some of the objects. I said, well, that's great. That's exactly what it's there for. We did a technical report of findings. Um, and if anybody is dying for all the details, if you email me, I can probably get you a copy of that report. Uh, there's a report for each place. They are very, very, very detailed and not very exciting, but uh, <laughs> uh, all, the, all the information is there. Uh, we were able to put together a display that's at the Voxman School of Music. Uh, we had a website, um, that's our overall website, but there were blogs while the work was being done and the lab work and the reports were being written. So for about a year or two, there was a blog every month or so that, that communicated progress and such. Uh, so that's a historical thing now. Uh, a marker was placed at Hubbard Park that uh, includes some information that was learned. And uh, there's a whole series of public presentations like this one. Um, I think this is the eighth or ninth presentation that was done somewhere in the state about this particular project, so we've been able to reach uh, quite, a, quite a few people. Um, if you do get a chance to go to the School of Music and see a uh, performance there, I presume they're going to open things up this fall and make that possible again. This is when you come up the big staircase and you're into the second floor. Uh, the archaeology display is not huge, but it's right there. I'll zoom in here. This is what it looks like. 
Um, and uh, originally it was going to be up for six months and then it was going to be taken down. And everybody has loved it so much that we keep being told, no, we want to keep it, we want to keep it. And so now it's on permanent display up there. Um, Yes, it is in the, uh, it is right up there, so, so you'll be able to check that out and then a sampling of some of the artifacts and the context and the, the story about uh, where it was um, physically uh, is, is recorded there. So uh, one of my staff members who's uh, creative came up with the, uh, with the title there. And that's what I have to share with you tonight, so I'm happy to take any questions if you'd like me to. Continue talking? Yeah. How does this compare, what you found, how does it compare to archaeological finds? I know that, that there, at least for a time period, there was ongoing archaeological stuff going on at Plum Grove, mm -hmm. for instance. And, I, you know, that's a, that is a different, if that was a farm and a, a well-to-do home. Yeah, and, and, and I was asked to repeat the question, so I'm going to make that a little shorter. But the, sure. but uh, the question was, are there comparable kinds of digs that have gone on in the Iowa City area? And and, and you mentioned Plum Grove. Uh, Plum Grove is a state-owned historical site, one of 13 around the state that the state actually owns. Uh, it's of course the the Lucas uh, homestead for the when he was territorial governor. Um, Tom Charlton, who taught at the university at, in the Department of Anthropology for several decades, uh, ran a field school there every year for University of Iowa students and collected a huge amount of information. Um, that is still being processed by his wife. Tom unfortunately passed away, uh, it's been almost 10 years now, uh, sort of unexpectedly uh, in the course of doing his research. So he never got to finish his analysis and do his, he, he planned a big book on Plum Grove. Uh, maybe someday something on Plum Grove will come out in print, but there sure is a lot of archaeological material that, that was collected there. And you're right, that, that's representative of a different end of the socioeconomic spectrum than much of what we saw from Hubbard Park. Hubbard Park had a range, but um, uh, that would have been sort of that next tier up of you know, the, the governor's home and what you would expect from that. Um, there have been other uh, projects around town, but most of them are smaller scale discovery projects or sampling for significance as opposed to large scale excavation. So um, I'm not thinking of one right off hand in town itself, but there have been other historical archaeology projects in eastern Iowa certainly that are comparable for time period. That, that what about like when Mercy Hospital has Unfortunately, those uh, situations have fallen outside of the compliance net. So they're not using government funds, they're not using government permits, so that construction can proceed. So it's unfortunately a very loose net of what does get required and what doesn't. So sometimes things like that. What digs are going on now in the state? Yeah, so what digs are going on now? Um, uh, I was talking with, uh, with uh, one of the audience members earlier before the talk started. Right now, uh, there is no large-scale dig going on anywhere in the state. Uh, there's lots of small-scale sampling projects going on. Uh, it's been a very busy year, actually, where we're starting to see an, uptuck, uh, an uptick in the infrastructure-related compliance work, but most of it is the survey identification and, and uh, at, at that level, so the front end of the process. I would guess in the next year or two something big is going to pop someplace and, and there will be a large scale project. Um, I just completed a four week archaeological field school for Iowa Lakeside Laboratories up in West Okaboji. I do that every summer. So we did a four week dig uh, with 11 students. So that was a fairly large scale effort for this year. Uh, that was on a, a woodland era site. So we had uh, some very interesting rock earth oven. Uh, lots of pottery, sherds, animal bone that came from that. Yeah. Do you know if there was any digging for this site? I, mean, uh, I don't believe so. This probably was all private dollars and, and such, and so again, that falls outside of the but compliance. Or any around ACT and stuff like that? Um, 
No, not that I can think of. I know when Scott Boulevard got built, there was a, there was a survey done for Scott Boulevard, uh, but I don't think there was anything that was discovered of note uh, because of that. Uh, but that's the only project I can think of in the immediate vicinity that would have triggered that kind of compliance work. On one of those early slides, you showed sites and mounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Iowa City was the, the home of, of some of the early mound building cultures, um, particularly along the, the Pie Bluffs above the, uh, the Iowa River. So um, the, uh, I forget what the name of the road is, it goes from uh, about where um, Mayflower is and there's that steep road that goes up. Is that Foster? Well, on the east side it goes up. Um, Bridge Road. Bridge Road, is that what it is? Uh, right as you get to the top there, there are several uh, what are now just single family homes that have documented mounds is in their backyards. And then on the west side of, um, of Dubuque, uh, when you turn onto Foster Road, uh, almost immediately there's a little tiny road that's called Woodland Mound Road. And it's because there was a whole string of woodland mounds that go up onto the bluff along there as well. So, but they don't uh, want you there. No, it's, it's private property and, and happily they're preserving them. So, uh, Would there be a chance that, that someday someone would be able to dig there? So, survey? Yeah, we have surveyed actually. So, so my colleague Bill Whitaker, who, who I showed you in the one photo, um, he has taken our total station equipment out. He's done a very detailed map of what's left and then um, uh, we've talked with the landowners about their long-term plans and they're, they're aware of them and they have a good stewardship perspective. So we're hopeful that that will be the case into the future as well. Uh, but digging mounds is something that really doesn't occur anymore because of uh, Native American requests to, to not disturb them. And they really are the, the resting places of the dead. So we, we treat those with respect, try not to disturb them. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, the, so the question is about flood history and, and, and records and stuff. Um, so a, some of that um, area in the southwest portion of Hubbard Park that I showed you that had that mixing, that mu some of that might be flood related, but I think more of that is, is mechanically pushed soils. Um, uh, this is that 1895 photo again, and the river Today, I think it's farther east than it is in this photograph. Uh, so a lot has been lost there. Um, but I don't think there's a tremendous amount of, of, of material coming up and being deposited like we have in some places. So, so not right there. One of the interesting things I'm remembering about um, when we were reading and, and researching all across campus for flood recovery was where Hancher was built. Uh, there are documents that celebrate the fact that it was making use of a former quarry area because they want, it was easy to build this orchestra pit literally in a pit, right? But they weren't thinking that what the river might do, right? So uh, somebody got a little too excited there, but uh, so that wasn't a great placement of a facility that eventually got, uh, got badly damaged there. So, um, do you know if there's something Courthouse, yeah, and the old yeah, I'm not sure what those would be. That um, certainly not the boarding house that you were talking about. No, no, because that would be a look, the next block back as well. So these are these are fronting. That's a big uh, building. Yeah, it is. Like it is. And I'm not sure where the Pentacrest would extend to now. Whether uh, is that um, Schaefer and what's the other one? Cal. Uh, no. Right, would be in our feed. Anyways, which, where the computer science folks are now, but uh, I don't know if, I don't think that's that same building, but um, uh, we'd have to do some additional research in 1895 and figure out exactly. Uh, but, uh, yeah. yeah, that might be a uh, early version of the power plant or something like that. So, yeah, these photographs are fascinating to, to try to decipher and connect up with, with actual details. Oh yeah, um, so the question is about the logo. Um, when the office was established uh, in 1959, uh, the person that was assigned the job of state archeologist actually stayed one year. 
he had been on the faculty since 1952 or 54, but he, um, he decided that opportunities elsewhere were looked more interesting, so he left after one year, and then they hired uh, Marshall McCusick, who was state archaeologist from 1960 to 1975. But early in McCusick's tenure as state archaeologist, as the office was just getting organized, he felt that a logo of some type would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. And at that time, he got uh, an early contract to do research from the National Park Service to document rock art in Iowa. So that's a petroglyph, uh, a pecked in design, into a rock face in a rock shelter in northeast Iowa. And it's a Thunderbird figure, which uh, probably dates to uh, around AD 1200, plus or minus a couple hundred years, a culture that archaeologists call Oneota. And the Oneota are now known to be ancestral to the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, where we get our name from, Iowa, um, and probably tribes like the Ponca and uh, uh, possibly the Winnebago as well. So that it was an area that was used by those people at that time, and this fits into their um, uh, cosmology uh, and belief system as a, a thunderbird, a, a, a messenger of uh, the upper world um, uh, to our world, and. Uh, is usually um, um, an entity that is bringing knowledge of some kind, so it seemed very fitting that it be the logo for the Office of the State Archaeologist to, to represent that. Anything else I can answer tonight? Well, thank you for your attention. You've been wonderful. <laughs>